If you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, as many of you know, and, and how could you not know this if you've been around a little while, uh, Janine and I are expecting in January our first grandchild, so we're really excited about that. And I don't really feel old enough to be a, a grandpa, but, I, but many of you have encouraged me with the great stories of the, the glories of being a grandparent, and so we're really excited about it. We can't, can't wait uh, until the end of January. And of course, um, our son and daughter-in-law have a lot of questions, right? They've, they've never been through this before, and so they asked us the last time we were there, like, how is this going to change our lives? What's going to be different? And uh, my, my son pulled me aside for a moment. He said, Dad, hey, when the baby comes, are Emily and I still going to be able to do stuff? I said, okay, now th- I need, that needs a little bit of clarification, I mean, because my, my answer could go in a variety of directions, depending on what you mean by that. Um, he said, well, we're going to be able to pick up and go on spontaneous trips, and we're going to be able to have people over till late at night, or we're going to be able to travel, or we're going to be able to do fun things. And I said, look, your, your lives are going to change drastically, but um, you're still going to be able to do the things that you love to do. It'll just require a little more preparation. I mean, even uh, going to the grocery store, you have to uh, pack all number of apparatus. You know, you have to have uh, bottles and uh, cups and toys and squeaky things and a stroller and all, all of these things. So it definitely changes uh, the way that you live. And my son said, well, will I still be able to, to get my rest? You know, very important for a 23-year-old. He said, will I still be able to occasionally sleep in on Saturdays? I said, well, you may be able to sleep in on Saturday, but you'll be sleeping alone on Saturday night. So I would encourage you to go ahead and just kind of get up and, you know, help out a little bit uh, since your wife works and all. Um, and so I said, look, things are going to change. Things will surely uh, change, but I will encourage you uh, with this. Things won't change in a single way that you regret. I mean, you will, you will be moved with gratitude and joy. And I said, treasure everything because the years really do uh, fly by. The birth of a baby, of course, changes our lives drastically and dramatically for all of those who are uh, around the new baby. Uh, but there was one birth of one baby, in fact, the only birth that radically reoriented the trajectory of history. It was a birth foreshadowed, actually, when the world was created. Uh, it was a birth that was anticipated by men and women for thousands of years. It was a birth that has, actually has tremendous implications for you today, whether or not you think about it or not but it was a birth that didn't take place the way anyone would have expected. This is the third week of our Advent series called Love Came Down, and I've kind of shared with you over the last couple of weeks the, the way, the outline of this series. Um, here's kind of the way that it has gone. In the very first week, we looked at creation and chaos, and we said, yeah, the world is not the way that it should be. It's messed up, and we don't have to look very far. In fact, we look in our own hearts, we see that things are not right. And then the second week, we looked at the promise of a coming one, the one who would restore and redeem and, and buy back all that was taken into slavery by the evil one at the fall of our first parents. And then this morning, we're looking at the birth of Jesus from Luke chapter 2. And I want to consider a few things this morning. What difference does it make? So what difference does the birth of Jesus make in our lives and really in the history of the world? And then also, what does it reveal to us about God? So Luke chapter 2, let me begin by reading verses 1 through 7. Here reads the word of the Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. We just sang some great songs this morning, and, and really... This morning is all Christmas songs, and, and some of those have such rich lyrics that we often don't really pay attention to because we've sung them so many times over the years. And, and the, the, the birth narrative can really be kind of like that in the sense that we've heard it so often, we've read it so many times that 
it's like a favorite song that, that you sing, but you never really consider the power of the words. So let me introduce to you uh, the main characters real quickly, and then we'll look at why this matters. The first person mentioned um, is Caesar Augustus. Um, he was the ruler of the Roman Empire for some 44 years. And if you've heard this passage explained before, you know that, that Caesar is not his given name, um, nor was Augustus. His real name was Octavian. But out of respect for his great uncle, Julius Caesar, he changed uh, his name. Julius Caesar was really a bit of a surrogate father to Octavian. And so Augustus was just a title, which means highly revered or honored. And this particular Augustus, Caesar Augustus, started out pretty ruthlessly in his rulership, but he kind of mellowed over time as things began to uh, sort of go according to his desires. Some historians actually argue that Caesar Augustus was the most successful leader of ancient Rome, the one who led the transformation of Rome from a republic to an empire. Um, He was the one who instituted all kinds of changes really to every aspect of Roman life, and and helped to usher in by his quality leadership a period of peace and a period of prosperity. He was so successful that he was regarded as a god in the empire. He was actually was worshipped as a god. He was worshipped as, um, unlike any other ruler, he was worshipped as a god. People looked at him with awe, and people thought that his regime, now they were a little narrow-minded in this, but they thought his regime would last forever. His regime and the prosperity that he ushered in would never actually uh, cease. The next person mentioned is Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria. He was a man of authority, but a man under authority, and so there was only so much that he could do. Uh, He had control over a small area, but he could do nothing outside of the reign of Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus, he was a very strong leader. He was also a a very good administrator. And as a way of ensuring balance and financial accountability in the world that he reigned over, um, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken, which then required every citizen to uh, return to their ancestral home, their hometown, you might say, the home of their ancestors, and to register. And so that meant that Joseph, who was living in Nazareth at the time, who was a carpenter, he had to return to Bethlehem, and he took with him uh, Mary, to whom he was betrothed, the verse 5. Now, we don't talk a lot about betrothal today. I don't know that I've ever had anybody say to me, oh, we just got betrothed. Um, If I did, I would think they were kind of weird. But uh, So no one really talks about this, but it really, it was something like engagement, only it was much more serious. You know, our engagements can end, and you you hear people who have had multiple engagements, um, that they can end for a variety of reasons. But the only thing, thing that could break a betrothal was either divorce or death. Betrothal was, was kind of the first step in, in marriage. And so Joseph and his betrothed, Mary, had to make this trip. But this was no easy trek. Nazareth was some 75 miles away from uh, where Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. And, and this was not the sort of thing that you could take a 40-minute flight to or even get on the freeway. It was either by, you either got there by foot or you rode a donkey, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, having a woman, a pregnant wife at the time, or woman, woman to which he was betrothed, uh, this was not a very easy journey. It was a very difficult journey. It was dangerous. Uh, there were bandits and robbers who, robbers who would often lurk in, in crevices of caves, and so there's a lot going on here. But Mary's about to give birth, and they have to make this long and dangerous trip, and when she and Joseph finally arrive, so you can imagine, imagine how exhausted she is. Uh, she probably hasn't slept well in the desert or in the wilderness during this trip. And they finally get to their designation, uh, their destination rather, and there's no place to stay. Nothing is available. Not a single vacancy. And so Mary and Joseph end up finding an animal shelter, what we call a manger, where there's no real bed, especially not a bed for an expectant mother. Um, only a feeding trough, something designed for donkeys and mules, and it's there that Jesus is born. This is where the God of the universe, John 1, the one who, if we can say colloquially, slung the the stars into existence, this is where the God of the universe made his entrance, in a cave 
for animals. Now, here's why those details are so important. Well, there's a number of reasons, but for the sake of this morning, this was not some random stroke of bad luck for these parents-to-be. These weren't unfortunate uh, circumstances or events that no one could have ever foreseen. This was exactly the way that God said the Messiah would enter the world hundreds of years before Mary and Joseph ever met. The prophets foretold of these details, the events, clearly. He, the Messiah, would be born in this little town of Bethlehem. Born of a virgin, born of the line of David, born in the most humiliating of circumstances. Now, there are dozens of prophecies throughout the Old Testament that we don't have time to get into this morning. Um, but this is, it's very clear throughout the Scriptures that the details were foretold, foreshadowed, and announced. The birth of Jesus uh, all of it, again, made clear through the Old Testament. And here in the text that I just read, all of these events, all of these prophecies are being fulfilled. So here's our first point this morning. We'll, we'll just make two this morning. First one is this. The manner, location, and timing of Jesus' birth all testify to God's sovereignty. How and when and where and the, the, the travels and the trek and the... the destination, the specifics of Jesus' birth demonstrate to us God's sovereignty over all things. God had declared from ages past, including all the details, how the Christ would enter the world. And here we see this all being carried out. The census ordered by Caesar Augustus, that, that was actually ordained by God so that Jesus would be born in the city of Bethlehem, again, which is the city that the prophets foretold. The lack of vacancies in the end, all part of God's plan to fulfill His centuries-old prophecies. Again, the timing, the location, the characters, the, the, the challenges, all of that stuff according to God's sovereign decree. When we talk about God's sovereignty, what we're saying is that nothing happens outside of God's infinitely wise plan, a plan that God has always had. Every event throughout all of history is ordained by God to accomplish an eternal purpose. So there's no such thing as happenstance, no such thing as luck, no such thing as unforeseen events, at least from God's vantage point. God is sovereign over all of life, and He is graciously working out every detail toward a designed end. Now you say, what comfort does that offer me? Well, what could be more assuring than to know that our trials and our tragedies, and our setbacks, and our hurts, and our failures, none of that is random, but all ordained by God for our good and His glory. You know, one of our practices here, as you noticed, is to read, recite catechisms and confessions. And uh, Well, I love the way the Belgic Confession of 1561 explains God's sovereign or providential care. Article 13 of the Belgic Confession says this, We believe that the same God after He had created all things, did not forsake them, nor give them up to fortune or chance, but that He rules and governs them according to His holy will, so that nothing happens in this world without His appointment. This doctrine affords us unspeakable consolation, since we are taught thereby that nothing can befall us by chance, but by the direction of our most gracious and heavenly Father, who watches over us with a paternal care, keeping all creatures so under His power that not a hair of our head, for they are all numbered, nor a sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father, in whom we do entirely trust, being persuaded that He so restrains the devil and all our enemies that without His will and permission they cannot, they cannot hurt us. So here's what you need to know this morning. There's nothing in your life going on right now there's nothing that you may soon face. There's nothing that's happened in your past that has happened to you randomly or by chance that has happened to you apart from the sovereign design of a holy and gracious God, a God who has good things ultimately in store for you. Now, we, we're here on this earth. Our minds are corrupted by sin. We only see a small portion of it, but God is in heaven. He sees it all at once, and everything He is working out is according to His infinite will and has done so because of the love that He has for us, His children. God's sovereignty runs throughout all the Scriptures, and it is most arrestingly clear in the timing, location, and the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Now, there's 
plenty more to the story. Look at verses uh, 8 and following. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was like there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. So before we get to what the angel said, let me just give you a, a bit of a clarifying word here about angels. When we think about angels, we've been you know, influenced somewhat negatively, I think, by some of the artistry and the portraits um, of the past, like this one, for example. This is from 1881. This is called Song of the Angels by William um, Adolf Bourgereau. And you can see the, uh, the picture behind me. Uh, notice the feathery wings and the uh, long hair held back by a hairband even. Um, you know, you have different... This is not how angels really looked, right? There, there weren't... Angels didn't wear hairbands, right? If they looked like Taylor Swift, they wouldn't have been so scary. Um, they, they were actually frightened. Now, there are different types and ranks of, of angels. And, um, but again, think less Taylor Swift, think more Chuck Norris. That's, you want to get a feel for what angels are like. And by the way, I just heard this the other day. You know... Uh, Chuck Norris has a, a grizzly bear rug in his living room. Um, the bear is not actually dead, just afraid to move. And that's, that's how uh, it is with, with uh, Chuck Norris. But when you think about the angels, don't think about, you know, soft and feathery and genteel and so on. Um, the angels in scriptures are real, powerful, intimidating beings. And when they appear, they scare people to death. They frighten people. They terrify people. And here they do the same, but they don't come with a message of judgment. Look at verse uh, 11 again. This is so good. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So to the shepherds, the angels say that this baby was both Messiah and Lord. He is a Savior. Now, of course, that begs a question. What do the people need to be saved from? Why does anybody need to be saved? Well, when we think of salvation, we tend to think of it as being saved or delivered from our bad behavior. So I used to cuss, but now I don't. I used to get really angry, but now I don't. I, I used to lust, but now I don't. I used to be impatient, but now I'm not. Well, if God has delivered you from some of those things, praise God for that. But those are actually behaviors that are only symptoms of something far worse, and that's actually a condition, a disease that we're all born with, the disease of sin, which makes us estranged from God. Of course, anything separated from God is, you know, suffers as a result, and so we this separation from God, the sin, the disease of sin, it leads to hatred and evil and despair and murder and poverty and racism and sexual perversity and all the things that fill our earth. And along with all of those things, and we talked about that a lot in our first week in creation and chaos, but along with all of those things, the result of sin in our world, we also experience a sense of alienation and, and guilt and a restlessness being apart from God. As we saw in our first Advent message, all of creation is groaning. All of creation is eager to be redeemed, waiting for the Redeemer, including every single person. And as we wait, we wait with anticipation and longing, but also restlessness and shame at times and worry and fear and anxiety. The fourth century African bishop, uh, St. Augustine, said it so beautifully after trying to find satisfaction in so many other things. He said, Everlasting God, you have made us for yourself. Our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. And we try to quell that restlessness by any number of things, by seeking it through pleasure, uh, by substances, by career success, by popularity, by finance, whatever it is. 
We have this restlessness that's part of being separated from God, and we look in every direction to try to satisfy that. But nothing ever works, and nothing ever will apart from being reconciled to God. If you're here this morning and you've not repented, you've not turned from your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are separated from God. You are alienated from God. You are estranged from God. You're not friends with God. Make no mistake. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, you're not friends with God. You are God's enemy. When anything is separated from God, it falls apart. Anything separated from God breaks down. When we're separated from God, our bodies break down, our minds break down, our families break down, our culture breaks down, our country breaks down. Life without God, just read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a series of disappointments, loneliness, emptiness, and isolation. But God, being merciful and loving, He gives us a chance to end our rebellion and be reconciled to Him. That's the message of good news that the angel brings. Not that good people get to heaven, but that God has made salvation possible for bad people, for His enemies. God sent His Son so that really bad people, the enemies of God, could be made right with God and enjoy the fullness of life right now. See, the message of the Bible, the message of the gospel, the one the angels announced, was not that if we do enough good, God will receive us. You know what that is? That's bad news. That's very bad news because we can never do enough to satisfy the requirements of a holy God. So it's not the the message of good news, glad tidings of great joy was not if you can just do enough that God will receive you. The good news of great joy that the angels announce is that God has brought salvation down to us. That forgiveness is ours by trusting in what God has done in Jesus. And this is good news, verse 12, for all people in that salvation is not just reserved for a certain race of people or people who are from a certain background or education or whatever it is, socioeconomic status, but all people, people from all walks of life, people with all colors of skin, people of all backgrounds and ethnicities and educations. Salvation is for, people, for all people. All who put their faith in Jesus will be saved, which is such good news that it actually leads to praise. First, there's one angel on earth with this message of hope and salvation, And then God sends a multitude of heavenly hosts to join in. Look at verses 13 through 20. The pages are stuck together, sorry. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. So I mentioned to you that Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome when Jesus was born, and he was a pretty good ruler overall. Again, he had some highs and lows, uh, but there was a period in Rome of unprecedented peace under his leadership. It was called the Pax Romana which is Latin, it just means Roman peace. It was 200 years of peace. And so when Jesus was born, it was a very good time to live in Rome. A very good time. Unless, that is, you were of Jewish descent and you were a worshiper of Yahweh, the God of Israel. If you lived in the southern part of the empire, the area of Judea uh, uh, that included Jerusalem, you were not at peace. The province, that province was ruled by King Herod the Great under Caesar, Caesar Augustus. But Herod, you know, you probably heard stories about him. He was very evil, very diabolical, maniacal, paranoid, all of those things. And so he was always worried about somebody defeating him. He was always worried about somebody uh, coming up the ranks or secretly taking over. And so executions under his rule were a daily thing. 
daily part of life. One historian says conditions at that time, especially if you were an ethnic Jew, were like living around spies everywhere you turned. You never knew who might hand you over to be put on trial for something you said, even something you said innocently. And all that to say, when the angels praised God and said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, the shepherds, and of course everybody else for that matter, would have thought that, they were, that, that the angels were talking about political peace, the end of Rome's tyranny, the end of Rome's oppression. But the peace that Jesus came to bring was something very different. It was first and foremost peace with God. Now, how does a person find peace with God? Well, it is only by being forgiven of the offenses that stand between us and God. And in Christ, the one the angels heralded, we have the forgiveness of sins, without which we can never have peace. So here's our second point this morning. True peace is anchored in the experience of divine forgiveness. There is no lasting joy apart from being forgiven by God in Christ. Now, that's not to say you can't ever have great moments and great experiences and great times and laughter and highs and so on, but those highs will invariably be accompanied by and followed by extreme lows. Again, times of loneliness and self-loathing and guilt and shame and feelings of alienation. There is no lasting peace apart from divine forgiveness. You ever wrong someone terribly and, and you knew that you had really done them terribly wrong and, and it just ate at you and you just couldn't stop thinking about it? You, know, you, want, you wanted so badly to think about something else, but you knew that you had done someone wrong, you had sinned against someone else, and it just was constantly on your mind. You couldn't sleep, you're tossing and turning, food doesn't taste good, you can't get any rest. You couldn't be around that other person. If you just saw that other person, you felt guilty about it. You had to either avoid the person that you had wronged or repent and receive their forgiveness. Well, imagine how much more that is intensified when we're talking about offenses against a holy God, sins against a perfect and holy God, a God who has never wronged anyone. You know, God has never wronged anyone. He has only and always dealt with every person justly. And when we wrong God, which we all do, it haunts us. In fact, 19th century Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon wrote, A man must have forgiveness or else everything else will be emptiness to him. What we need is to be reconciled to God, which only happens when we're forgiven. And here's the good news, again, of great joy delivered by the angels. In Christ, the one come down, God forgives us by absorbing in Himself the painful and destructive consequences of our sin against God. The baby who was born lived a sinless life for you and me. He died a brutal death for our rebellion so that we could once for all and finally be forgiven. And finally, enjoy peace. Now, yeah, it's, it's hard living on a sin-cursed and uneven planet. It's hard living in this broken world. But we can't have peace. But the only way to have peace is through forgiveness in Christ. Now, I was thinking about this the other day. This is my 21st Christmas as a pastor, which I'm incredibly grateful for, grateful to be your pastor, one of your pastors, and grateful to be able to to devote my life to the study and proclamation of the Scriptures, and very thankful for that. This is my 21st Advent sermon series. That's 21 years of preaching. Now, if you you crunch the numbers, um, and I don't know what the exact number is, but let's say conservatively, that's at least, I preached at least 500 different sermons. And in each of those, I like to include at least three or four illustrations, stories to kind of drive home uh, you know, a certain point. And I keep a record of every sermon illustration that I've ever uh, employed over the years. So it's, you know, hundreds for sure, more than that. And so I can tell you when I shared a particular story, when I gave a particular illustration, 
But there's one illustration that I love that, that drives home this point about our need for forgiveness more than any that I could think of, at least during this week of my prep. And um, it's not my story. I, I didn't write the story. It's actually from Ernest Hemingway. And I shared this illustration here at Cabshaw in June of 2018. So if you're around then, you've heard this before, but I'm going to share it anyway since it is Christmas at all, and I, and I love this story. Uh, in June of 1936, Ernest Hemingway, who, as you may know, was a Nobel Prize winning novelist, he published a, sh- a short story called The Capital of the World. Now, Hemingway wrote a lot of short stories, um, and this is one of the least well-known stories, you might say, but I think it's one of the most powerful ones. And it tells, it gives the account of a young man by the name of Paco, who was a handsome young man in his late teens, and he takes a trip to Madrid, Spain, to escape the poverty of his hometown. And Paco, he kind of abruptly leaves his family. He leaves his father, and, and he does so. Again, it causes a real conflict, and, and they become estranged. And he kind of takes what belongs to him, and he leaves, much like the, uh, the stories we read in the Scripture, right? And so the prodigal son. And so Paco, he demands what's his, He leaves and he goes to Madrid, Spain, and he wants to establish a life on his own. And what he really wants to do above all else is he wants to be a banderiero. He wants to be a a bullfighter. And so he he ends up getting a job waiting tables at a restaurant. He's serving uh, food. But when he sees the matadors come in the restaurant, he envies them. And he wants to be them so badly. It's all he's ever wanted. He wants to wear what they wear. He wants to do what they do. He wants to be known for their, the prestige that they garnered. It's all he thinks about, except for one other thing. Paco has in the back of his mind that he has done his own father wrong, and that really bothers him. He grieves over that, and the, and the estrangement between him and his father, it just keeps producing more and more guilt and shame. Paco hasn't seen his father in what seems like forever, when Paco left, again, it caused a terrible riff, and the two of, those, two of them have been estranged. Well, as the story goes, Paco's father comes to Madrid. His father comes looking for his son. He's heard that he's in Madrid. He doesn't know where. And he looks everywhere, but he can't find him. No success. So finally, in an act of desperation, Paco's father places an ad in the local newspaper, which reads this, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montaña. Noon Tuesday, all is forgiven. Papa. And when the father arrives, this is why I love this story, when the father arrives at the hotel on Tuesday at noon, he's absolutely stunned. He can't believe what he sees. A crowd of 800 young men, all named Paco, are there awaiting his arrival, and each one desperate for a clean slate. The crowd is so large that that Spain has to actually call in the National Guard to disperse the young men. 800 young men named Paco all there. And what do they want more than anything else? They want to be forgiven by their father. They want to see their father again and experience a sort of reconciliation that comes by being restored. Now, Ernest Hemingway was not a Christian as far as I know, but he understood something about forgiveness. Everybody is longing for it. Everyone is desperate for it. It's really part of the human condition. Certainly, horizontal forgiveness. And maybe you've got somebody that you've wronged in your life, maybe part of our church or part of your family, and and you've not actually sought their forgiveness, and it just keeps eating at you. Yes, we need horizontal forgiveness desperately, but even more so vertical forgiveness. The forgiveness from the God who made us. Forgiveness from the one who created us, who designed us in His image, who created us to worship Him and enjoy Him forever. We are desperate to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. When Matthew, we don't have time to get into it, but the other gospel writer records Jesus' birth, here's what he says about it. He describes it this way, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Salvation equals the forgiveness of sins. Salvation equals justification, being declared not guilty for all the sins we've committed against a holy God. Now, certainly, that's not all there is to it. 
As we saw in the first couple of weeks, God will actually save or restore all that's wrong with this world. And He'll make it all new. But all of that starts with the forgiveness that we experience by putting our faith in the life and the death, the cross work and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you've turned from your sin and put your trust in Jesus, you are among those with whom He is well pleased. It's just a, a way of saying it's, you're a recipient of God's grace. And that means you don't ever have to worry about whether God is for you or against you. He is always for you in Jesus. You have been made to be at peace with God. A never-changing, objective reality. You are at peace with God. And, and, and as such, He always has your good and His glory in mind. And He's always working out things for your ultimate benefit. Now, will we suffer? Yes. Will we go through terrible pain and loss? Yes. Will we experience grief? Absolutely. Sometimes so deep and so palpable that all we can do is sit in silence with no words to say. But even in those darkest hours, we have hope. We know that God is sovereign and good, and even now, He is working in the world to reverse the curse of sin through the advancement of His kingdom as we look forward to the second advent that the first advent, the birth of Jesus, points to. God has not abandoned this world. In fact, He sent His Son into it to redeem it. This is the beauty of Christmas, God's perfect plan come to fruition in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what we've been talking about throughout the series And this is the reason we're going to sing in just a moment, joy to the Lord, joy to the world rather, the Lord has come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what joy is ours, what peace is ours now because of the coming of Jesus Christ, the one who lived a sinless life, obeyed every command, satisfying fully your law, the requirements of your law, and dying the brutal death that we deserve, though he himself was without sin. And you raised him from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, as evidence that his payment for our sins was completely and totally sufficient. And I pray you give us the grace to believe it this morning. Pray for the person who's here this morning who, who's not believing, who hasn't trusted in Jesus, still living according to her own wisdom, still living according to her own ideas, his own insight, his own paths, his own ways. Father, will you bring that person to repentance and faith? And for the person who is in Christ, but still played with doubts and fears about how you really regard him or her, will you help them to know today that you have forgiven them because of Christ and you now delight in them as a son or daughter? Give us the grace to receive it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.